In my last lecture, I focused on identity and protest art within the United States. Remember that Puerto Rico is part of the United States, albeit not a fully integrated part. Now we move back into the wider world. We talked about a book from the sky briefly at the end of our mop-up unit on Asian art just before Christmas break, which was a lifetime ago, right? So let's recap. What political context do these two works have in common? Well, they're both about the Cultural Revolution, right? The lithograph on the right is pure propaganda art designed to inspire the faithful to support Chairman Mao's efforts to install, instill revolutionary purity by force if necessary, even though the poster itself is very unthreatening. A book from the sky is widely interpreted as a protest against the Cultural Revolution, although it cares, carries deeper and more confusing meanings. Since talking about this work in December, I found a very interesting video on Zhu Bang and his work from the Bloomberg Brilliant Ideas series. As always, the whole video is up on Moodle, but I'm going to let this excerpt serve as my main lecture on this work. So this work is a commentary on language and its manipulation, on mass production and commercialism, and on government propaganda from Mao's Little Red Book on. And maybe it's also a frustrated rebel's commentary on our inability to communicate, or at least to communicate truth. But one of the reasons I like this artist is he didn't actually give up on language uh, or on communication. One of his projects during an 18-year stay in New York was English calligraphy, using Chinese characters to form English words. So can you read this banner designed by Zhu Bing and hanging outside the Met? Art for the people. Zhu returned to China in 1988 to help lead his alma mater, the state-sponsored China Central Academy of Fine Arts. In recent years, his work has continued to focus on reimagining traditional Chinese art. Increasingly, it reflects a heightened consciousness of environmental pollution, which is a huge problem in China. So here is a work entitled Background Story. It's a tribute, as you can see from the front, to traditional Chinese landscape painting. It's also an imaginative recycling project. The painting is, in fact, images shaped from waste that form in the form of a landscape seen through frosted glass. When viewers walk around the painting, they encounter trash. As with Book in the Sky, from the Sky, this work turns out looks like one kind of art and turns out to be something rather different. So here's another waste work, a giant phoenix sculpture exhibited at the 2015 Venice Biennale or Show of Contemporary Art. You may recall that our polka dot lady, Yayoi Kusama, first rolled out her mirror balls outside the 1966 Venice Biennale. So what three things do you want to remember from this work? Well, here's another installation artwork by a Chinese artist and another example of social and political commentary. So there are really two remarkable facts that you need to remember about these seeds. One, I gave away in the label of the previous slide. It's the seeds are made of porcelain. Just as remarkably, each seed is hand painted and individual. The seeds may look alike, but like sunflower seeds in nature, each is subtly different and individual. So let's watch a couple of brief clips from a video that the Tate Gallery produced about this work. You will see and hear from the artist himself. So what point do you think the artist is trying to make with this work? Here's what the Tate website has to say. Sunflower seeds invites us to look more closely at the made in China phenomenon and the geopolitics of cultural and economic exchange today. The commentary continues, the precious nature of the material, remember it's porcelain like the David vases, the effort of production and the narrative and personal content create a powerful commentary on the human condition. Sunflower Seeds is a vast sculpture that visitors can contemplate at close range or look upon from the bridge above. Each piece is a part of the whole, a commentary on the relationship between the individual and the masses. What does it mean to be an individual in today's society? Are we insignificant or powerless unless we act together? What do our increasing desires, materialism, and number mean for society, the environment, and the future? By the way, the Tate stopped allowing people to walk in the seeds when the museum discovered that this was spewing potentially hazardous ceramic dust into the air. 
And yes, this work is about the Cultural Revolution as well. Propaganda images from the time often depicted Chairman Mao as the sun and the mass of people as sunflowers turning toward the sun, that is Mao. Yet, and I'm quoting the Tate website again, I remember the sharing of sunflower seeds as a gesture of human compassion, providing a space for pleasure, friendship, and kindness during a time of extreme poverty, repression, and uncertainty. Sometimes, apparently, it was all people had to eat. So, sunflower seeds represent propaganda, poverty, community, and friendship all at the same time. It makes them really a very potent symbol. So, we're not going to have you write a similarity and difference essay about this work. Too little time, alas, but I'd like you to stop and talk for a minute about how the political messages of these works are similar and different. So, as always, I don't know what you just said, but it seems to me that both represent a commentary on propaganda and the manipulation of symbols and language during the Cultural Revolution. Both showcase traditional Chinese arts and, at least indirectly, therefore, criticize a culture of mass production. Both offer employment for people with traditional skills, such as carving wood blo woodcut blocks for printing and creating and painting porcelain. But Zhu Bing's work is deliberately mysterious, even uncommunicative. It holds a lot of words, but no meaning. Even if the Chinese Communist authorities were convinced that the book from the sky had to contain some kind of subversive secret code. Sunflower seeds, by contrast, as we just saw, carry multiple meanings for the viewer, especially for the Chinese viewer. And yet these meanings are much less disguised and maybe more optimistic as well. Uh, I should note one further similarity. Both artists suffered from political upheaval in their youths. Zhu Bing was exiled to the countryside during the Cultural Revolution. Ai Weiwei, as a child, was exiled with his father, a well-known artist and poet, to a labor camp in the Gobi Desert, fell afoul of the communist authorities. Both artists later got into trouble themselves with the Chinese communist authorities, and in both cases, the authorities eventually relented. After the 1989 Tiananmen Square revolt, you may recall seeing the photo on the bottom right before, the Chinese authorities turned against new wave artists such as Zhu Bing, and in 1990 he left for America where he felt he could work more freely. The government did not prevent him from leaving, and he returned in 2008 to a prominent government art post. Like Zhu Bing, Ai Weiwei also spent a number of years in New York, but he decided to return to China as well. Ai Weiwei was arrested in 2011 and placed in detention for 81 days. The authorities also confiscated his passport, which meant he couldn't travel outside of China. They returned the passport to him in the summer of 2015, as you can see from the photo. Uh, the government also accused and, in fact, even convicted Ai Weiwei of tax evasion. The artist denies these charges. I didn't look up anything about that one way or another. Well, I always look for other works by the same artist, both because I'm curious and because I want to give you a heads up for possible attribution questions. As you can see from this handful of examples, Ai Weiwei's installation sculptures are really extraordinarily varied. But can you identify any kind of a common theme? Well, I wonder if they aren't all to some extent addressing the contrast between a rich artistic tradition of handcrafted work and the rise of globalized mass production. Of course, China is in the center of that. So, what three things do you wish to remember about this work? Well, we talked about this work before, too, even longer ago, very beginning back when we looked at global prehistoric art and the role of animals in art. So this short museum video clip should serve as a refresher, and I predict you'll enjoy seeing the performance elements of this art. So in terms of content, what does our corned beef can bowl have in common with sunflower seeds? Well, it seems to me they're both commentaries on the loss of indigenous or national traditions in the face of economic globalization, although that's not the only theme of either one. Uh, both works might also fit into a loose category known as conceptual art, a term I encounter a lot but haven't really talked about. The Tate, again the gallery, defines conceptual art as art for which the idea or concept behind the work is more important than the finished art object, although conceptual art as a movement really is dated from the 60s and 70s, I still think The Fountain by Duchamp is the most famous example. So the video in your reading point out that tinned corned beef has replaced local foods within the Pacific Island diet, and that it's commonly given as a gift at weddings, funerals, feasts, and other special occasions. 
The canned meat is high in fat and cholesterol. By the way, it's made in Samoa. Uh, those That's where the cans come from. Uh, so that contributes to a huge obesity and diabetes problem in the islands. The introduction of cattle, likewise, has changed, and many people argue degraded the sensitive ecosystem of the Pacific Islands, especially Tuffery's native New Zealand. Uh, cattle use a great deal of water. They pollute rivers and produce methane gas, and land is being deforested to produce pasture land for cows. And by the way, China is implicated in this one as well because the huge market for beef cattle from New Zealand in particular is China. So why does the term 2000 appear in a work produced in 1994? I didn't have a clue. So I did some research. One scholarly article reported, and I quote, the 2000 in the title suggests millennial fantasies and brings to mind stereotypic cargo cult practices. Cult followers have frequently assembled or reassembled wealth objects or bearers of wealth in ways patently fetishistic and irrational from the perspective of Europeans. I'll bet that was hard to follow, but it's a very interesting point. So does anybody know what a cargo cult is? Uh, cargo cults arose in the South Pacific, especially the islands of Melanesia. These are islanders who pretty much had Stone Age technology. And when they encountered their first Europeans, some tribes saw the huge array of goods that Europeans brought with them and worshipped the goods or the people who produced them. Uh, in these societies, by the way, the the chiefs, the leaders, were often people who could contribute great goods to their own society. So there was a kind of transference. Some of these cargo cults actually believed that spirits would bring them similar goods at some point in the future. That's the millenarian aspect. Sometimes members of these cults would use local mater materials to construct fetishes of European goods. Again, a symbol of what they hope to be brought. So here are some photos of cargo cults. Uh, as you might guess, many of the first contacts were made during the Pacific campaigns of World War II. And of course, Pacific Islanders aren't the only millenarians out there. A lot of people fear that 2000 might bring a catastrophe, especially if all the computers shut down when the millennium rolled around. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that as an adult. Any rate, yeah, Y2K didn't happen, at least in the way doomsdayers were warning. But clearly, Tuffery is concerned with culture and economic catastrophe. And maybe there's some ambiguity in the message as well. Are outsiders inflicting health, economic, and ecological catastrophes on Pacific Islanders? Or, by purchasing and valuing Pisupo, are Pacific Islanders bringing catastrophe on themselves? Probably both. So, what three things do you want to remember about this work? Well, I realize I'm including a lot of videos, but one opportunity we have in this last unit is the opportunity to hear the artists explain themselves. Wonderful as it can be to hear, for example, Simon Shama talking about Rembrandt. Imagine what it would be like to hear Rembrandt talking about Rembrandt. So hang in there and watch this excerpt from this artist's TED Talk. It will give you an opportunity to see many other works in the series, which I thought was interesting. So what is the content of this artwork? In other words, what is this artwork about? Well, I figured I should know what the words on the face said. So when I was preparing your study guides, I looked them up and I included the translation in your reading. Once you knew something about the poet and what the poem said, did you look at the work any differently? Well, the artist considers herself an opponent of the current political regime in Iran. Some of her works, particularly her films, are more clearly hostile to the Islamic government. So why all the guns? Is she criticizing women for embracing violence? Is she admiring their strength and determination? What does she think about martyrdom? So here's another work from the same series with a poem by the same author. So how do you interpret the titles of these two works? Are women silenced by the Islamic revolution or have they just found a different way to speak? Or maybe both. This deliberate ambiguity, and notice we see a lot of ambiguity in these works, it's brought down a lot of criticism on the artist. The Iranian leadership views her work as dangerous and subversive. They're almost certainly right. But a lot of outsiders are uncomfortable with, seem, with what seems to be an admiration for violence. What do you think? 
just to further muddy matters, here's another work from the same series and a poem by a different author, this time a modernist feminist uh, who's now deceased. Uh, her writings have been strongly condemned by the Islamic regime, and partly because she talked about how women should not be subjugated by men. So maybe this too is the silence voice of women. Okay, what three things do you want to remember from this work? Oops. This was one of your summer works. It sure seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? It's also the last work for today, and maybe I'm getting a little punchy because what really struck me when I started doing more research into this work is that most of the commentary I encountered in the press isn't about the meaning at all. It's about efforts by the public and the press to guess how this word was, work was actually made and installed in the Tate Gallery. Specifically, how in the world did the Tate Gallery install a huge crack down the center of a major gallery floor? So here is the official Tate Gallery statement as reported in a British newspaper. Quote, the artist and Tate are not going into great detail other than to say we opened up the turbine hall floor in order to create a cavity, a spokeswoman says. The work was made with utmost precision according to drawings by the artist and nothing was accidental. Well, that uninformative statement set the press into a frenzy of investigative journalism. And I read several articles where builders were interviewed about pos techniques that might possibly have been used. They're actually kind of funny. But I think The Guardian may have solved the mystery. So here's an excerpt from their article that I posted the link here. Mr. E is a builder who was working at Tate Modern on another project when Shibboleth was being installed. And although for contractual reasons he does not wish to be further identified, wants to be able to work again at the Tate, uh, he is very happy, uh, that was my addition by the way, he is very happy to recount what he witnessed. Quote, this is from the gentleman himself, Mr. E. They dug a dirty great ditch about a yard wide and a yard deep, says Mr. E, still lost in wonderment. Then they brought in lorry load after lorry load of cement and poured it in using 10 foot sections of what looked like carved polystyrene molding to form the sides. And by the way, for those of you who don't speak British, lorry is truck. Then a whole bunch of people lay down on their stomachs for about a week and finished it off with brushes. Looked bloody uncomfortable, I can tell you. It's about racism. Can't see it myself, but I'm not much of a one for modern art. It was a pretty good trench, though, and went hell of a lot of cement. Good luck to him. Well, the meaning is probably less mysterious than the medium or its installation. I'll just tell you what the authors, I'll tell you what the author says in a minute. But first, what do you think it means? Okay, here is from the Tate website. Salcedo is addressing a long legacy of racism and colonialism that underlies the modern world. A shibboleth is a custom phrase or use of language that acts as a test of belonging for a particular social group or class. By definition, it is used to exclude those deemed unsuitable to join this group. Okay. You guys have taken Bible. You can do better than that. Where does the word actually come from? To continue the Tate's commentary, the history of racism, Salcedo writes, runs parallel to the history of modernity and, is un and its untold dark side. I would just add that it actually is a major part of pre-modernity as well. But at any rate, for hundreds of years, Western ideas of progress and prosperity have been underpinned by colonial exploitation and the withdrawal of basic rights from others. Our own time frame remains defined by the existence of a huge socially excluded underclass in Western as well as post-colonial societies. In breaking open the floor of the museum, Salcedo is exposing a fracture in modernity itself. Her work encourages us to confront uncomfortable truths about our history and about ourselves with absolute candidness and without self-deception. And here's what the artist told the BBC. Shibboleth represents borders, the experience of immigrants, the experience of segregation, the experience of racial hatred. It is the experience of a third world person coming into the heart of Europe. One other minor note about experience, apparently several people had the experience of tripping on this crack, and so apparently the installation was somewhat marred by the addition of various signs warning people to watch their step. 
So Dora Salcedo was born in Colombia in South America, and she continues to live and work in Bogota, at last a global artist who has not moved to London or New York, although she did earn a Master's of Fine Arts at NYU. Her art is deeply influenced by Colombia's troubled past, which includes not only the legacy of colonialism, but also dictatorship, drug wars, and an ongoing civil war. So let's hear briefly from the artist. What you see on this slide is perhaps the most famous of her installations, although it's not a required work. On the 6th and 7th of November 1985, members of the M19 guerrilla group took over the Palace of Justice in Bogota and held the, the Colombian Supreme Court hostage. The siege lasted for 53 hours and almost half of the 25 Supreme Court justices died in the attack. Seventeen years later, Salcedo lowered wooden chairs against the facade of the new Palace of Justice. The installation took place over 53 hours, the length of the siege, and Salcedo described it as an act of memory. So, last time today, what three things do you want to remember about this work? Ooh, just two more lectures to go. In my next lecture, I will look at feminist art from around the globe.